Hey everyone, this is Miss Eisenberg. So, past few weeks in science, we've been talking about the dangers of water pollution. We've been talking about ways that we measure it, and we've also been talking about different ways that we can mitigate it. One of the suggestions uh, that came up in the idea of point versus non-point source pollution was what individuals can do. And for those of you that were in my one meeting, we discussed the importance of rain gardens, and we also talked about the fact that I've been looking to install one. So I decided to use some of my, um, we'll say, extra time, quarantine time, to go ahead and install my rain garden. So I'm going to show you guys the space that I'm looking at. I'm then going to uh, talk about how I selected the plants for the rain garden. We're going to talk a little bit about the dangers of um, native versus non-native species, what it means to be an invasive species, and essentially you'll have a video or two each week, which will go along with the science lesson. So starting with a little bit of catch up, which was last week's lesson, so the idea of mitigation. So here is the space in question, as well as my dog. So this is an area of my yard that generally speaking becomes a pool a uh, favorite hangout for the local mosquito population. And while this is in my backyard and not a normal place for a rain garden, one of the unique features about my uh, backyard is that I actually back to an easement area. So this easement area is, used to be maintained by Baltimore City, but is now opened for the neighbors. This easement area not only has all the power lines, but it also has the sewer uptake lines as well as some of the piping that is used for being able to take gray water uh, from the houses and taking it down to the city to be cleaned, which means that it's a huge area um, for potential seepage, um, making the, my backyard actually a good place for putting in a rain garden to try to mitigate some of the seepage that is coming into the area. So, plan so far is to dig out the area and then start putting in some new plants that are going to help with this water issue um, with the hopes of reducing some of my point source pollution as well as some of the point source pollution that is coming from my neighbors as well as the rather large road that I am off of. Um, which is one of the primary access points to GBMC Hospital. So I also apologize in advance if you guys hear a lot of sirens while I'm doing any of these videos. So let me know if you have any questions. I'm looking forward to doing this project with you guys and hope you guys enjoy it. Hey everybody, it's Miss Eisenberg. I'm here with the second part of my rain garden journey. Uh, today's video is going to be talking to you about uh, making smart goals as well as how you can use the science and engineering practices, SEP, for regular things that you might have to do around the house. So starting off, uh, last week I mentioned a little bit on um, why I wanted to do a rain garden. So just going a little bit more into that because I got some great questions. So why a rain garden versus a regular garden? Well, the first part of that was figuring out really what my goals were for this project. What did I hope to accomplish? And one of the big things that I had mentioned is having all of the pooling in this back part of my yard, see if you can see it, with a focus on that wonderful little ceramic pot that you can see that is actually covering up an open access point to the water line for carrying out the gray water from the neighborhood. I also mentioned this wonderful um, easement area behind me. 
And because of that easement area as well as because of my neighbors, there are a lot of pesticides and herbicides that are being sprayed here, meaning that there is the high potential for water pollution. Um, my house, my backyard is also on a slope. It's sloping down from the front yard. The highest point on my property is my front sidewalk, which goes up against the primary street. Um, as I mentioned the other day, I'm right by GBMC Hospital. So there's a pretty decent amount of traffic in by my house. Um, the sloped is part of what causes all the pooling back here. The second part of that is you can kind of tell from looking behind me, the easement area itself is actually flat. That way they can get their vehicles back there from the side street. Um, and then it slopes again drastically going into the backyards behind me. Um, and even more so going down the hill for that side street. So these are all things that made me believe that a rain garden worked the best. And after doing more um, investigation, um, Maryland Extension Services had a lot of great information. Also Anne Arundel County, their website, and Howard County, um, a little bit for Baltimore Tree Project. So looking at all those different resources, reading things, investigating it. And like I mentioned in the past video, this is something that my husband and I have been talking about for probably eight months, if not even a year at this point. So lots of research, lots of investigation, a lot of asking questions. Why native plants? I'll talk about that in a lot of detail next week. Uh, next week, we're really going to be digging into what it means to be a native plant, what it means to be invasive, non-invasive, as well as the different tiers and how that all connects to the idea of overpopulation and resources. But for this week, now that you know why the rain garden, um, what are my specific goals with the rain garden? What are my SMART goals? So breaking everything down, obviously being specific in the fact that I am going to be putting in a rain garden in my backyard. If we want to be really specific, this is in the southwest corner of my backyard. Um, because of regulations that I looked up, I cannot put the rain garden right up against the easement area. I also can't put the rain garden right up against the pipe. So I did have to keep um, six feet distance um, from those two things. Again, the idea of they have to bring in vehicles to the area. So measured that out, which then gave me my current space. Uh, my current space is this awkward little kind of misshapen triangle or um, ice cream cone, I think is really the best description for it. Um, it's about 10 feet long. It's six feet at the widest, um, but the majority of it is closer to two feet, three feet. So I am looking at somewhere between 40 and 55 square feet of rain garden that I'm going to be filling in as I am dodging the sunlight. I will know that my rain garden is successful, so I'm looking at those measurable um, metrics. I am looking to eliminate the pooling that is happening around that inflow. I will be looking at the next coming um, rain events, including the ones forecasted for this weekend, and measuring what the existing pooling is, and then I'll be able to make comparisons once my rain garden is installed to see if it's actually successful. Um, for my timeline, I am looking at having this completed within two weeks of the frost date. Um, today is the Thursday before Mother's Day, those of you keeping up the weather, you know that we are actually under a frost watch or a frost advisory for this weekend. There's also the potential for some winter weather. I need to wait until all that is over with so that my plants don't die. Um, so two weeks from the frost date, that puts me right basically at Memorial Day weekend uh, for getting all of this installed and taken care of. That way my plants should have their roots mostly established before the peak heat days um, and the end of June going into July and of course then looking at August. Also hoping to take advantage of some of the rain patterns that are happening right now. Um, we have had a lot of moisture. It's supposed to continue being this way for the next two weeks. So this will again give my plants the best chance. So believe that is everything for this video. As always, if you have any questions, please send them my way. Uh, third video, be making that next week. Hopefully it'll be a little bit warmer outside when I do that. And the focus is going to be on invasive versus non-invasive, talking about overpopulation, talking about what it means to be a native plant versus an introduced plant, why that matters, why you should care, and starting to get some ideas for what you guys can do as we look towards the end of May, the beginning of June, and your own projects that you'll be designing. So talk to you soon.
This is probably my favorite part of the entire process, actually planning out my garden, figuring out what size it was going to be, figuring out what plants were going to go into it, figuring out how I could best utilize this space in order to solve my problem. I was able to find a lot of amazing resources online through the Maryland Extension Program and the various master garden organizations and groups that are out there. I was also able to locate this incredible image uh, courtesy of the Chesapeake Bay Foundation for Stormwater Management, which gives pretty detailed picture of how to go about measuring and installing a rain garden. So I didn't have stakes, did have chopsticks. So using my chopsticks went out to my backyard with some string and was able to plot out what my rain garden size would be. And this is the area in the top right hand corner. The other things that are marked in, the small circle just to the left of the gate, that is the open um, sewer pipe. To the left of that are some existing bushes and structures. And then on the north side of my house, that is a brick patio and surrounding bushes as well as an HVAC unit just to give an idea of the rain garden proportionate to the rest of my yard. So in the end of the day, my goal is for the rain garden to take up between 15 and 20 percent of my backyard. Other things that I found regarding my rain garden were the pipes. Luckily, we had had um, this utility come out before and marked where pipes were. So we knew starting this project that there were no pipes in the vicinity of the rain garden, that all of the pipes, all of the wires, all of the cords that could be a concern, they are all to the east side of the gate and not at all in the area that I was going to be digging in. However, I did have to take into consideration some of the trees that were on the property before we moved in that had been taken out in uh, the Directo a number of years ago, as well as the existing trees on the property. So I knew that I was gonna have to limit myself to smaller shrubs and to flowering plants and wouldn't be able to do as many small trees or large shrubs due to root issues. So, once I had found a plan that I liked and once I had mapped out my rain garden, I was able to get a general idea of size for it. And I was then able to use my string and my chopsticks to figure out the channel and where best to put in the main pond area for the rain garden itself. I was also able to go online and using various sites from Cromwell Valley Park, find native plants for this part of Maryland, and was also able to identify a couple of local nurseries that were in stock and were providing curbside pickup, or in the case of my primary nursery, a meadow side pickup. This allowed me to order the plants that I needed while supporting local businesses and following social distance guidelines. So the plants I originally selected, uh, Buttonbush is going to be my primary anchor for the rain garden. He will get to about four feet high, three feet wide. I'm then going to have two scarlet bee balms as accents. These guys will be about two feet high, but not more than a foot in width. Then adding in some maidenhair ferns. Maidenhair ferns are really fun because they tend to clump together, making um, really interesting textures pretty low towards the ground. Then for some pops of color, I picked out some wild columbines as well as swamp milkweed and Virginia bluebells. Another one that I was interested in trying is goat's beard. For this, I am looking at a cultivated version of dwarf goat's beard. Um, truly native goat's beard is pretty tall. He's a good sized shrub. I knew that was going to be too big for my area, but I did need to find something that would be low down and close to the channel itself that would absorb as much water as possible. For this sketch, I also added in a few more details, such as a holly bush that I was able to find underneath the ivy in the backyard, 
and the outflow pipe itself, as well as some of the existing trees on my property. So science being science, sometimes things don't always go according to plan. One of the first things I noticed was while I was digging out the perimeters, a large number of holes in the ground. Um, further digging turns out that these were cicada holes. Some research led me to find some brood maps showing that brood nine, which is generally North Carolina, Virginia, and West Virginia, is actually getting ready to emerge. Um, but most likely what I'm actually seeing mem are members of brood 10, which is known to be in the Maryland area. And while they are primarily forecasted for next year, there is a chance there um, could be coming some out this year. So this is definitely something I'm going to keep an eye on and see how many wind up emerging. I found probably three dozen when I was digging. And as you can tell from some of my later pictures, I did not dig up all of my original rain garden area. So I can only extrapolate out how many are probably in my backyard, um, which is a little terrifying. Second problem were all of the bricks I found. And this led directly to why there's a large chunk of the rain garden that is not finished, um, even as I am recording these notes. I was definitely not anticipating uh, to find the bricks. Um, over the course of digging out the rain garden, um, I came across well over 60 pounds of bricks. Still trying to figure out what to do with them, but this did lead me to moving and adjusting some plants, um, as well as trying to come up with some new long-term solutions for getting all of those bricks out of my yard. So once I identified my primary problem of the fabulous bricks, I had to start making some adjustments to my plan. My first adjustment, I expanded the garden um, one foot to the south. This would give me more area for the, for the slope, for the 5% slope that was necessary, given the bricks and the fact that I was having a hard time getting down pretty deep. I also expanded the pool um, by six inches in order to accommodate a very large root that I was not planning on um, encountering. And also shifting some of the plants to the south and the west again to accommodate for the bricks. Second adjustment, after working with two different local nurseries, I was not able to find swamp milkweed. Um, instead, since this is going to be a native area and since this is backing into an easement zone, uh, zigzag goldenrod was a suggestion for replacing the swamp milkweed. Zigzag goldenrod is pretty aggressive for a native plant, so it's generally not suggested in regular garden beds. This is something that'll quickly and easily take over. I'm hopeful that putting him close to the fence, putting him close to the holly tree that I found while clearing ivy in the easement zone will keep them somewhat in check. I'm also hoping that the goldenrod though will battle out some of the English ivy and the Japanese honeysuckle that was planted by neighbors on the backside of my house. We'll see how that goes. Another adjustment, um, I did have to bring in another cultivator and do a woodlawn uh, creeping flocks. After talking to some people um, over the phone at one of the local nurseries, they were concerned that the standard creeping flocks I had selected would not do as well in the partial sun, um, dappled sun area where I was planning on planting it. Woodland flocks is typically found uh, slightly further west than where I am in the Piedmont Tidewater region. This is something that we would see getting closer into Frederick County. Work on my garden began the first week of May. I knew that with the anticipated cold weather coming in, I needed to take advantage of the existing warm temperatures to start digging out the rain garden itself before ground became um, too hard to really do anything with it. This way I would also get an idea of what could be underneath it 
which turned out to be a really good idea given all of the bricks and cicadas that wound up being in my way. Once I had that all figured out, I was able to put the order in for my plants, get my plants picked up. The nursery that I was working with, they were only ordering based on orders that customers were actually making, which meant I did have to wait about a week and a half before my plants came in. But this wound up not being an issue at all because of the extreme cold we encountered over Mother's Day weekend. So that wound up working out to my advantage. I got the plants that Saturday morning and I was able to store them safely in my basement until after all of the freeze watches and freeze warnings had passed the area. I started digging out the majority of the garden uh, for the actual plants themselves on Mother's Day, which wound up being an absolutely fabulous way to spend such a gorgeous day. We were able to get in about half of the plants in the backyard. This is also when I had to make my second round of um, adjustments, the official plan for it to figure out where I was going to put in the woodland flocks since the regular creeping flocks was not going to work, as well as realizing that some of the bricks and some of the concrete pieces that we were encountering in the backyard, we were not going to be able to remove without renting a jackhammer or some other equipment, which at this period, at this time is just not a feasible option. I uh, was then able to get the majority of the remaining plants in the ground over the next few days. And on May 14th, I was able to pour in the last bit of mulch and the last bit of rocks for the pond once I finished extending out the area for the pond. Hey everyone, it's Ms. Eisenberg again, and here is the final or potentially final video showing the end result of my rain garden, or in the very least where it is right now. Um, as you'll see though, this is going to be an ongoing project. I still have a couple of things I need to figure out. So starting with showing you what it looks like. Notice my dog in there investigating one of the bigger issues. And so here with the rain garden, you can see the finished project. You can see the uh, dwarf goat spear there in the front. There's Virginia bluebells, uh, zigzag goldenrods, uh, button bush, some wild columbines. There are also some ferns and some phlox. And there's obviously still that big pile of bricks. And as you saw from the slides, that has been the biggest um, issue, the biggest surprise with this project was the number of bricks that I found in the ground here. So as of now, the bricks are just chilling in the corner. Um, got a couple of ideas for what to do with them. Nothing really certain as of now. Um, other big thing to figure out, you can kind of see there in the back, there is some invasive um, common ivy and some English ivy. There is some native Virginia creeper um, in the front corner of my yard, so I'm debating uh, about trying to train the Virginia creeper to possibly come back here and take over where the invasive ivies are. Haven't decided that one yet. Um, also been debating putting in a bird bath or another water feature um, so that this can be a certified Audubon bird uh, habitat. And those are really the big next steps is deciding where I want to go next with this garden. What work do I want to keep doing with it? Obviously the bricks getting them to go away. Um, and while the wood pile back there is extremely beneficial to local wildlife, I might want to do some sort of a native screen or some sort of a native buffer so that it's not as visible. But those are things to keep working at, things to keep figuring out. The biggest test though is going to be what this garden does after a huge rain. So far we've only had a few very mild rains 
everything's been fine. There's been no pooling, no f um, flooding over by the um, overflow pipes for the sewer. But I still need a big rain to really see if this is going to work. But here is my rain garden as it is right now. And I am looking forward to working with it over the rest of the summer and also working with it come fall and even next spring and seeing what I can do to make it more efficient and to make it even friendlier for different types of wildlife. So thank you for joining in. I hope you have enjoyed uh, the videos. I hope you have enjoyed the slides. I do have um, some resource information at the end for anybody who is interested in putting together their own rain garden or their own native garden in general, or anybody who is just interested in the different certifications that are out there for maybe your existing backyard or your front yard even. So have a great day. Stay safe. Stay healthy.